Good evening, everyone. Welcome to iFocus Online, Lecture 127 and Glaucoma Session 31. And today we have our own Dr. Vanita Patak Rema. And uh, she'll be talking on hand holding a trap, management of trabeculectomy in the immediate post operative period. And I request Dr. Pradeep, sir, to please introduce them. Hey, good evening, everyone. Uh, Dr. Vanita Patagre, as all of you know, that she is our own and uh, she is here in this program for the past two months, but still it's my responsibility to introduce her formally. Uh, she did her MBBS uh, from University of Kolkata in uh, 1992, and uh, she did her FRCS from Royal College of Surgeon Edinburgh in 1997. And she did her glaucoma fellowship uh, from University of Toronto, Canada in 2004 and FRCO Royal College of Ophthalmology in 2006. She has 17 years of postgraduate ophthalmic surgical experience spread across the North America, Europe and India. She was a consultant ophthalmologist, glaucoma specialist for over 14 years, initially at Cardiff, UK, followed by LV Prasada Institute, Hyderabad. Currently, she is a director of glaucoma and senior glaucoma and cataract specialist at Center for Sight Hyderabad since 2017. So it's all your Dr. Vanita. She would be talking to us on trabeculectomy and early post-op management. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Pradipyas. Thank you for the kind words. Uh, without much ado, I will uh, just, sorry. I want to first unshare again. I wanted to. Um, share, optimize video clips and the sound as well. Here we are. Okay, well, um, we had a wonderful lecture uh, on uh, trabeculectomy and uh, its complications just uh, last week. And uh, it's a big task following up on uh, Professor Keith Barton. Um, but I will try and uh, do justice to this uh, very difficult uh, subject. My disclosures are as follows and none of them are relevant here. So the scope of this talk really is to understand favorable characteristics of a bled. Um, if you're not clear what you want, maybe you may not get there uh, after all. And the rationale of, uh, of a standard um, uh, management related to wound healing. This is also something that is not well understood and therefore possibly uh, leads to the uh, suboptimal uh, results in trabeculectomy. Um, followed by clinical evaluation of blebs. What do you need to look for in the immediate postoperative period? Is it just IOP? Is it just AC? Or is it other things as well? And in combination too. And understanding the management of failing blebs. Now, just knowing how to diagnose is not enough. You need to understand how to manage these blebs as well. And of course, also remembering the site threatening post-operative complications. I'm limiting myself to the early uh, phase, possibly up to six weeks of trabeculectomy, which is really makes, this is the period that makes or breaks your trabeculectomy. So an ideal trabeculectomy bleb should be low. The characteristics should be like this. It should be low rather than high, diffuse rather than localized, and posteriorly directed rather than anterior and focal. Um, you can see in the bottom picture here that the bleb height is barely more than the corneal thickness, one corneal thickness. So that is what you really want to aim. And you want this to happen in a repeated fashion. And uh, we know that that does not always happen. And blebs can fail. And these blebs that I'm showing you now are really at the late stage uh, of failure in the late, late phase. But you can see uh, what we are talking about, localized bleb, this is a ring of steel, this also has a ring of steel, this also has a ring of steel and possibly has, excuse me, uh, you know, uh, a scleral fistula, a full thickness scleral fistula, which could be leaking. And then these are the mitomycin C blebs, which unfortunately, if you are using only in an anteriorly, uh, uh, you know, placed sponge, you will end up with... Uh, 
blebs like this, which are ischemic. These are not avascular, these are ischemic. Uh, or this one, which is also overlying the cornea and this one too. And you can clearly make out that ring of steel, which means that this bleb is delimited and is not functional. So they can also become dysesthetic. And really it's the really large blebs that actually uh, start giving symptoms to the patients. But as Professor Barton told us, even the diffuse blebs can do that. Now there are various bleb grading systems and I'm not going to go through, through them at all, but I would just let you know that there is a Mofields, Indiana bleb grading system. And then there is the very less known Woosberg. And believe it or not, this is what I like to follow because in a clinical uh, situation, I find that it is much better to apply this grading system to my bleb. Why not Mofields? Because it is rather complex and, you know, very uh, dependent on the height of the bleb, whereas I like to get diffuse blebs. So, uh, I, I feel that these systems, both Morfields and Indiana, as you're seeing now, are more suitable for research purposes. I, I like this one. This is called the Wurzburg bleb system, where uh, you look at vascularity, you look at corkscrew vessels, encapsulation, and microcyst. Vascularity, you should at least aim for similar to adjacent conjunctiva, and if it is avascular, even better, not ischemic, but avascular. Then corkscrew vessels, none should be present. Encapsulation, none should be present. And microsis should be present over the entire bleb. What do we mean by microsis? Well, it is this bubbly appearance that you see over the conjunctiva, very high magnification on, uh, on the thinnest slit beam that you can possibly get and the highest, brightest illumination. If you look for it, you will find it. If you don't know that it is present, then, you know, I always say what the mind doesn't know, the eyes don't see. So what is the rationale of the current standard management vis-a-vis -vis stages of wound healing? This is very important. What are the stages of wound healing anyway? You know, if you look at it broadly, and I'm not going to go into extreme details, there is the inflammatory phase, there's the proliferative phase, the maturation phase, and then th there could be a failed bleb where you get this inactive scar tissue. If you do not intervene in these stages at the correct with the correct maneuvers to make your to, uh, bleb succeed. So in the inflammatory phase, which is caused by polymorphic nucleosides and even macrophages, your intraoperative dexamethasone and your postoperative top topical steroids work. Whereas uh, where, where the fibroblasts are concerned, certain intraop maneuvers like minimal conjunctival manipulation, small incision, non-charring hemostasis, as well as post-operative topical steroids help to control uh, the excessive reaction related to fibroblasts. Then in the proliferative phase, which is due to angiogenesis, uh, granulation tissue formation and its contraction, here is where your intraoperative mitomycin C kicks in, and of course your postoperative topical steroid control continues, uh, where maturation of the uh, of the wound is concerned, a collagen deposition with disappearance of blood vessels. Here again, long-term postoperative topical steroids control, and in where the uh, scar tissue is concerned, where excessive collagen deposition takes place. Unfortunately, this does not respond to any drugs and you have to intervene. So what are the primary interventions that you can do vis-a-vis -vis these uh, phases of um, blood or wound healing, whatever you may call it. So inflammatory phase, of course, you can increase your topical steroids. Proliferative uh, phase is where you start applying your suture lysis, or if you put a releasable, you release that. You can even use 5-FU injections. I will show you in what kind of blebs they help. And I am a, a big fan of instituting digital massage. And of course, not in the early phase, not in the first week or two. But after that, yes, I, I teach dig digital massage and I will show you how I teach my patients. And uh, in the, when the 
uh, wound has matured and is not functioning, then you have to go for uh, my mitomycin C or 5-FU needling along with digital massage. And in the inactive scar tissue phase, 5-FU also will not work. You have to do MMC needling and or consider revision in the OR. Okay, now there is uh, generally a standard protocol most people follow. Uh, this includes topical steroids, antibiotics, as well as cycloplegics. Where topical steroids are concerned, I always say dose and duration should be customized to the individual blend and to the individual etiology because more is required in combined cataract and glaucoma surgery when the patient has been on medication for a very long time or when you are doing TRAB in certain secondary situations like uveitis, aphakic a a glaucoma and neovascular glaucoma. I tend to avoid TRABs in these, but you know they, they, it is still uh, practiced quite widely. Topical antibiotics, at least for one week, and cycloplegics, uh, one to two weeks, def spe specifically in angle closure glaucoma. So clinical evaluation in the immediate post-operative period, of course, we will talk about intraocular pressure, whether it is high or low. And in combination with anterior chamber depth, whether it is shallow, whether the depth is variable, or whether it is deep. Each word has a significance. And the characteristics of the bleb, whether it is formed or whether it is flat, that also makes a difference. Seidel's test, whether it is positive or negative, and of course, even a posterior segment examination, whether choroidals are present or absent. And please, please, please don't forget conioscopy because a patent ostium is very necessary for any of your interventions, if you are undertaking any, to work. And I'm not saying do it in the first week. I don't think it's seldom required in the first week, but even if it is, you can take necessary precautions, adequate antibiotic prophylaxis, and still do a gonioscopy. So anterior chamber depth, quite often people ask and are not sure what we mean by shallow anterior chamber. So grade one is when your central AC is formed, but there is peripheral iridocorneal touch, as you see there. Grade two is when central AC is still formed right up to the pupillary margin. And grade three, the most severe form is when you have a flat AC. Here you can see the AC is completely flat. There is pupillary uh, lenticular corneal touch. Why is this important uh, and significant? Because A, there is risk of cataract. B, you, if it is left for long, your cornea will decompensate and you may have peripheral anterior synecy formation. So really my commitment to you today is to take you or handhold you through the differential diagnosis of various clinical conditions, which include low IOP with shallow AC, high IOP with deep AC, and also high IOP with shallow AC, which is of course being covered by Dr. Uh, by Professor Keith Bartlett, but I will uh, reiterate again today because those are the site threatening complications of trabeculectomy. And then you may ask me, where is low IOP with deep AC? Well, that is the aim of TRAP. We want lowish IOP with deep AC in all our TRAPs. So a uh, uh, differential of low IOP with shallow AC is wound leak as well as excessive filtration. So what will you find when you look at the bleb? It's formed poorly. AC may be shallow or flat, IOP is low, and your CIDLs is positive. But if you do not do a CIDLs test when your IOP is low, spe specifically in single digits, you will never find this. And you will often wonder why the pressure is low. So you have to do a CIDLs test. It occurs in up to for 18, maybe 20% of traps, especially in phonics based conjunctival flaps. When we say Wound leak, we mean in the early stage where bleb is still not formed. Whereas when we talk about bleb leak, we probably mean that it is a late feature, especially in thin wall cystic bleb. So this is sort of happening later on in the, um, in the life of that bleb. So here we have, this is sidles. In case you've not seen it, uh, basically what you get, sorry. Basically what you get is a, an aqueous, dark aqueous lake in the center with 
two streams of fluorescein on the two side. That is very important. And if you continue observing it, you will always find that progressing down to the lower lid as this one is doing. All right. So um, uh, as I said, the uh, incidence of bleb leak, if you see most large studies, they have said it's around 15 to 17 percent. And the, the, there is this study, uh, which was basically an audit study group uh, from the UK, who have studied 428 eyes, a rather large study, which gives you a better idea of the complications that can take place. So I will quote this study as well as the next one, which actually included more than 1200 eyes, which found bleb leak to be 17.6%. And the majority of it happened in the uh, first few weeks of trabeculectomy. These are the two studies that I'm going to quote most often in this uh, talk of mine. So how do you manage a wound leak? Uh, you could do a pressure bandage or you can use a bandage contact lens, which is what I favor actually. I find bandage contact lens lenses very useful. You must cyclobleach and you could titrate topical steroids as well. You could use aqueous suppressants. Remember if aqueous is flowing through a wound, then the lips of that wound will always be open. Now this principle we want for the scleral wound. We don't want for the conjunctival wound. There is a role that doxycycline plays, and I'll discuss that in a little bit. Uh, if the leak is large, then one should be considering uh, resuturing. If resuturing alone will not sort the leak out, then one may even consider, consider a congenital autograft or an amniotic membrane graft. When it's late, then the management is completely different, and I'm not going into that at all. So what is the role of doxycycline? Well, basically, doxycycline reduces inflammation and elevated uh, levels of pro-inflammatory cytokines. These cytokines degrade the extracellular matrix. So it exhibits an anti-collagenolytic property. Uh, it also, sorry, it, it inhibits the members of the matrix metalloproteinase family, especially MMP9, which are expressed by fibroblasts, which again plays a role in the degradation of the extracellular matrix, which leads to tissue destruction. So here we are, have a look at this particular real world case of a, uh, a leak that occurred four weeks post trab. Uh, first few weeks went sailed, we sailed through. But unfortunately, when the patient came back to me in the fourth week, this is what happened. And you will see very soon, you're already seeing an aqueous leak in the center and uh, the fluorescein stream by the side. But uh, when the uh, patient closes his eye, then you see how it originates and how it flows down. This is very much positive Seidel's test. Not that there was any doubt because look at the, um, the uh, large area that was uh, unfortunately leaking. Uh, conjunctiva had melted over there. Um, and I placed a bandage contact lens and gave this patient doxycycline. And it took two and a half months, almost two and a half months for this to heal, but he did heal. And you can see now that has completely disappeared. Fluorescein is not leaking. You can see fluorescein around and he is now controlled without any medication. So I find doxycycline very, very useful uh, along with bandage contact lens in uh, leaks. Here's another case which was actually managed with several layers of amniotic membrane graft. Uh, you can glue it, you can also suture it. And this lady was managed with conjunctival um, uh, autograft, which, uh, you know, this has been taken a few weeks after the autograft. Uh, this bleb eventually failed. Please remember, wound leak is actually not a very good prognostic indicator. Therefore, we must try and avoid it as much as possible. Moving on to the next one, when you have a good or large bleb with a shallow-ish anterior chamber, low IOP, and sidles negative, then your diagnosis really is an excessive filtration. <clears throat> Where you get large blebs, and these generally tend to have choroidals as well. So when they're in the periphery and they're, they're shallow, you don't need to worry about them so much, but they can become 
uh, much larger, they can become kissing choroidals. And if these do not uh, resolve in four to five days, then you may end up with uh, disastrous consequences related to the retina. When uh, Beth Edmonds et al. Re reported almost one in five cases of shallow anterior chamber with hypotony, meaning low IOP. Here we are, one uh, other case, very large bleb, uh, trap done elsewhere, patient came to me for management. Uh, I managed conservatively because as you can see, the central AC is still formed, pupil, is, uh, pupil margin is clear. Right, and look at this one now. This also looks like, this looks like a diffuse bleb, but you need to look right up there. There's a huge aqueous lake. Um, you have to look carefully. This J young JOAG girl, she had hypotony maculopathy. She had choroidal folds, she had disc edema, and she also had shallow choroidals in the periphery. Uh, and when choroidals increase, as you know, they give this dark shadow. You really don't want them to come to the center of the <clears throat> posterior pole. How do you manage excessive filtration? Well, you cyclopleach. That is very, very important. You want the AC to deepen. You want uh, the iris lens diaphragm to go back. And you also need to reduce your topical steroids. What that does is that it you know, enhances healing. So what happens is the pressure rises. Your more invasive interventions are required only if there is danger of lenticulocorneal touch. Because as I told you, there's a risk of cataract, there's a risk of corneal decompensation, as well as, as pass and hypotenuse maculopathy. You can even develop a hypotenuse maculopathy so the patient's vision may drop. In the early phase, you reform the anterior chamber with you know whatever you have, gas, air, viscoelastics, or you may ha even have to consider drainage of the choroidal effusion if it is present. In the late stage, of course, it's man managed in a different fashion. But more than overfiltration, you know, underfiltration is the problem in trabeculectomy. The incidence from subconjunctival episcleral fibrosis is up to 20% in the early period. And of course, it increases in the late period. And not only that, you also tend to get or can get an encapsulation up to 10% in trapped patients. <clears throat> so a failing bleb, meaning there is a rise of IOP in the post-operative period when AC is deep. You need to make sure that the patient's patent, ostium is patent because if it is not patent, then the management is completely different. Why? Because you have to see what is it being blocked by. Is it iris, in which case you need to do a YAG synecolysis? Is it vitreous, in which case you have to do an anterior vitrectomy? And is it blood or is it blood? If it is blood, and if it is a small amount of blood, you can still observe it because, of course, clot will lice. But if it is a large one, then you have to consider a washout. On the other hand, when the ostium is patent, then it depends when this is presenting. If it's less than equal to one week, then as a physician, as an ophthalmologist, as a glaucoma specialist, you apply posterior focal compression at the edge of the scleral flap by by, by self, don't allow the patient to do that. If it's presenting between one to four weeks, then you consider laser suture lysis, you consider uh, releasing a releasable if you've got it there. If it's a congested bleb, you try 5-FU, and of course, you even think about a digital massage. If it's greater than four weeks, then of course, there is a dilemma, do we restart medication? Do we have to redo any kind of surgery or do we consider a needling? So in the early stage, early weeks, days to weeks, as well, well as weeks to months, you recognize a failing bleb, of course, with high IOP, deep AC and poor formation of bleb. And it could be hyperemic or very congested, but these are known as corkscrew vessels. Or it could be very high, angry looking, insisted bleb encapsulation, so to speak. And in weeks to months, of course, it can become flat, flat with the flap edges visible. So, excuse me. When the IOP is high and the ostium is patent in the first week, as I told you, 
blood massage can be attempted by the attending physician. Now, uh, Kervan et al., which uh, the uh, audit that I was talking to you about, they did it, um, uh, con considered laser suture lysis or performed laser suture lysis or uh, suture related manipulation in up to 43% individuals. That's rather, but that just tells you that you have to be on the ball. You have to, if the pressure is rising, you have to be able to pick it up. And I have generally seen it happens with between weeks two and three maximally, not even week four. So how can you do it? How do you do laser suture lenses? This is a unique a special lenses. This is a Blumenthal lens, which uh, helps to magnify the view of the suture as you can uh, see there. And you can even use the Hoskins lens, lens, which has a flange, but the flange is rather large, as you can see here. So when I use it, I generally don't really, really don't need to uh, use it to open up the lid. But here there's one uh, being done with Blumenthal, uh, Blumenthal lens, where uh, argon laser is used, power is between 250 to 750, spot size is the smallest, 50 microns, and duration should be slightly, high. as a result of which, you can achieve a laser suture lysis within one or two shots. It doesn't take long. On the other hand, you can construct a releasable. And I show you one that I, I did. I generally don't do it in adults. I do it in pediatric cases. And this is a pediatric case where you first take a bite from the scleral side into the cornea. Then you retrace your steps back under the conjunctiva. <clears throat> pull your needle through, and then take a bite of your flap and then the sclera. And then you use four throws to lay it down flat. And that's about it. You do not tie it off at all. Then you trim your sutures and bury your sutures within your conjunctiva. You trim your sutures and bury them. There you go. Okay. Here's one I did in an adult, having said <laughs> that I don't do it in adults. The reason I don't do, because I have found that my rate of uh, suture lysis is not very high, and I do have an argon laser at my disposal, so I use argon laser suture lysis much more. Here we are. This is, this is the uh, corneal loop, so to speak. Uh, and the reason a loop is better than, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, the end hanging loose is because it stops the windshield wiper syndrome, so to speak, which uh, uh, with every eye movement or blink rather, where causes a windshield wiper change in the cornea. So in this particular case, again, I didn't need it. I didn't need to remove the suture. This is at three months, I think, and at one year, uh, maybe more than a year, you can still see it there because I didn't need to use it. And that's the reason why I don't like to uh, use uh, releasables, but uh, they are a wonderful um, skill to have in your armamentarium. So the difference between the two really is the fact that with laser suture lysis, you need a lot of equipment. Not only do you need a lens, um, uh, you need argon laser, of course, at your disposal. There can be some difficulty when tenons becomes thick and you can get a conjunctival button hold. Whereas with the releasable, mostly it happens when the suture becomes, the difficulty is when the suture becomes friable and there is breakage of suture as, and there can be breakage of suture as a complication. There has been an RCT which says that either suture techniques can be performed equally, uh, giving equal uh, efficacy. Then the next situation, high IOP, deep AC, is when you have these really rather congested blebs, which is what I was talking about, corkscrew vessels. Of course, ostium has to be patent. Five FU injections can be done in such blebs and can be commenced as early as the second week. You can give five milligrams subconjunctivally weekly, and you can give, go up to 10 injections, maybe even 12 injections. Um, complications are generally minor with uh, uh, SPKs and subconjunctival hemorrhage. Uh, in the audit study, you can see that up to 28% eyes actually received by the few, one or more. So here um, I'm showing you a case where the injection was done. This is not the same case, but uh, the injection is done eight to 10 millimeters away from the bleb. That's uh, how I, I like it. 
And these are two blebs that were managed with five FU injections alone. Um, multiple were needed, but they uh, did well in the long term. Then when there is a high bleb, then you really got a, an a encapsulation. And this should initially be managed with aqueous suppressants. If it does not settle down, then you need needling and encapsulated in the study we are talking about by Beth Edmonds et al. They have reported 3.4% encapsulated blebs. This is what we mean by um, encapsulated. They're really high uh, and can be quite angry looking. Um, also means can be quite congested also, as you can see there. And this particular bleb was managed just by, uh, insisted bleb was managed just by aqueous suppression. You can see the skeleton of the, uh, you know, these ghost form of the previous rather juicy vessels. But when you do have failing trap where bleb is flat and the flap edges are visible, as you can see there, um, I normally don't do a triangular one. These were sent to me for management you really need to consider needling. Um, again, please remember, osteum has to be patent. So uh, a gonioscopy is a must. And if you're uh, thinking of doing it uh, at the slit lamp, a good antibiotic prophylaxis is also very, very important. And um, the uh, audit group reported about 17% needling in the early post-operative period. So this is how you prepare. This one was done in the OR. Um, so you prepare the eye with uh, topicals and antibiotics. And sorry, how you do the injection is what I wanted to show you, not the drops. So we we'll skip that for, for a minute. Uh, it's not moving. Yeah, there we are. Once you've done that, then you load the uh, local anesthetic as well as mitomycin C on an insulin syringe. I use 0.4 milligram per mil and I load 0.05 mil of that on an insulin syringe. I bend the needle, um, either use 29 gauge or 30 gauge, and then you inject eight to 10 millimeters away from the limbus. You raise a bleb, slowly lay, raise a bleb for the patient. And how you can diffuse it is by using buds, as you will see now, use of cotton buds to not only enable absorption, but diffusion over a wide area. And when I now lift the lid, you will see how it has diffused over a really wide area. Um, I remember Dr. Uh, Professor Barton saying that it stays in one area, but I specifically make uh, uh, arrangements for it to be diffused over the wide area. How do you do the needling? Basically, if you're doing it at the slit lamp, you use the same needle, like I said, 29 or 30 gauge over a two minute mil syringe, bend it to 45 degrees, use low magnification and needle entry is two millimeters from the blood. Bending the needle helps, uh, enables entry, easier entry. At the slit lamp, uh, here, I'm just assessing the bleb height. And once that is done, it's put on diffuse elimination and needle is entered about two millimeters, minimum two millimeters away from the bleb and forwards and backwards motion is carried out. You hear a grating sensation, which is actually what you're cutting, you're cutting fibrous tissue. Lysis is achieved when you see your bleb forming much better. If your bleb does not form with subconjunctival, then you have to go subflap. And if when you do it at the slit lamp, then of course you can assess the bleb height, you can do a pressure, you can do so many more things. That's why I prefer to do it at the uh, slit lamp, but not for, not for all patients. Here is a patient who was done uh, at the, um, in, in the OR, where uh, initially this is not the bleb, this is where mitomycin C has been injected and diffused. I'm going horizontally and I'm not forming a bleb of any note. So then I prefer to go vertically. See, my, my direction has changed. Going vertically means I'm cutting 
fibrosis under the scleral flap. And once I'm cutting fibrosis under the scleral flap, yes, there is a little bit of bleeding, which is invariable with mitomycin C, but you can see how easily I enter into the AC once I have done that. A little bit of blood actually is a good sign because it tells you that there is communication between the subconjunctival space and the AC. And this is yeah, before, after and before pictures as uh, for this particular patient. So digital massage is also very important. I institute it pretty early. Uh, I instruct the patient. Um, uh, hopefully I have... Uh, what I do is ask them to count. I ask them to press on the side of the eye. And make that is what I do because I do not want them to press on the eye in a That is why I make them count. Anyway, so the complications of needling again mostly are transient. You get subconjunctival hemorrhage, you get SPKs, you can get a needle tract uh, leak, you can get a little bit of high. High femur, but of course, you know, hypotony and choroidal effusion also can occur if the pressure does not pick up. So here's this patient uh, we showed you uh, with the um, flap edges visible. They have disappeared. The patient has uh, got a good bleb and good pressure without medication, diffuse bleb. And here's a high one, which again, post needling did much better. From a very high one looks to be a flat one. But how do, you, how do I know it's not flat? It's because I can see microcysts. And uh, these microcysts are much better captured on the slit lamp with your eyes rather than with the camera. But here we are. I showed you this picture uh, in, at the beginning of the talk. So, and the last but not the least, please don't forget, patient can be a steroid responder. The chance of a glaucoma patient being a steroid responder is higher. But please remember, this is a diagnosis of exclusion. Just because you have high pressure, uh, you cannot label everybody as steroid responder. Stop everything and just put the patient back on anti-glaucoma medication. You have to do your assessment with regard to blood, with regard to ostium, with regard to uh, blood vessels, everything put together, okay? Um, Generally, bleb well formed and possible contralateral high IOP as well. Please remember that. That it could have contralateral high IOP as well. Then this is the differential of high IOP post um, filtration surgery with shallow AC. And these include aqueous misdirection. Of course, pupillary block is very much uh, a differential. And so is suprachoroidal hemorrhage. So when you have poor or no blab and sidles negative with high IOP, progressive shallowing of AC, both ach uh, axial as well as peripheral, meaning a flat AC. So this is a flat AC, but if you have it um, in proportion also, meaning it is peripherally as well as centrally um, shallow, then you're talking uh, in the presence of a patent iridotomy or iridectomy, it is aqueous dis misdirection unless proven otherwise. Please remember aqueous misdirection can also present with normal IOP sometimes. The risk factors we all know is filtration or any kind of invasive surgery in um, primary angle closure glaucoma. And there are various others that have been listed in uh, literature. I just have a very brief video about aqueous misdirection. I'll put the voice voiceover on for you guys to uh, understand aqueous misdirection. Aqueous misdirection is a serious but rare entity that occurs typically after incisional surgery for angle closure disease. It is characterized by shallow peripheral and central anterior chamber with raised or sometimes normal intraocular pressure in the presence of patent peripheral iridotomy. The most accepted pathogenesis is that an abnormal anatomic relationship exists between the ciliary body, lens, an anterior hyaloid causing diversion of fluid into the posterior segment. Aqueous pockets within the vitreous raises intraocular pressure.
and thereby exerts a force on the anterior hyoid that causes a forward displacement of the lens iris diaphragm, recognized clinically as a uniformly shallow AC. Aqueous so I hope you've understood, um, you know, that we really don't know the reason, but these are the possible uh, explanations for why aqueous misdirection occurs. So um, how do we manage it? We obviously always start with medical. Um, if the patient is on any kind of meiotics, you have to stop it. We can consider laser as well as surgical options. There is um, this uh, very comprehensive review of uh, current concepts on aqueous misdirection in case you are interested. So where medical is concerned, you use midriatics, never meiotics, anti-glaucoma medications, dimox, mannitol, you name it. In about 10 to 25%, you may get a resolution or you may have to go on and use laser where you do a YAG laser posterior hyaloidotomy. Argon laser to ciliary processes also can be done through a very large PI. Generally, it can lead to resolution in up to 50% cases, but uh, actually relapse is pretty common. So surgical, generally you wait for about five days, for, you allow medical therapy or, and or laser to give a chance. So here is a case where the AC was absolutely flat and post laser, there was slit AC formation. So that was not enough. So the patient had to go, go I had to go ahead and do a uh, surgical management for this particular patient. Hmm. So what, what, what uh, about the surgical management? Like I said, you wait about five days. Principle is to establish communication between anterior and the posterior segments. So uh, you uh, get a unicameral chamber. You can either approach it anteriorly, what is known as iridozonulohyloidovitrectomy, basically anterior vitrectomy, plus removal of lens if the patient is phakic, or you can consider a pass planar posterior vitrectomy, which has been the mainstay treatment, but I have found several cases of recurrence post pass planar vitrectomy. Whereas in the series that uh, we have reported, which has just got accepted, uh, no relapse occurred. Uh, following IZHV. Here are some cases pre and post uh, intervention. You can see how deep the anterior chamber is. In all cases, pressures were controlled uh, and they are different etiology, primary angle closure glaucoma with tube, primary angle uh, post phaco yak caps and so on and so forth. So there are multiple, multiple etiology. Then when you have a flat bleb with uneven depth of the anterior chamber, high IOP and non-patent iridotomy or iridectomy with sidles negative, you know it's a pupillary block. Remember that here the AC um, is um, differential depth, variable depth. It's shallow in the periphery and deep in the center. This is not a post trap one, but I just wanted to demonstrate. You can see it's shallow peripheral and deep anterior. The, uh, um, compare it with aqueous misdirection, which is shallow both peripherally and centrally. So when you do an LPI in angle closure, uh, you know, normally you want to place it in the uh, superior region or you want to place it temporal or nasal whatever it might be you don't want it want to place it where it is bisecting the lid because that that is when patient starts getting dysphotopsias or uh, symptoms when you are considering lpi and iris bombay or secondary pupillary block then you actually don't worry about these things you go where the hump is the highest and you place mid peripheral lpi that's when you will get resolution, resolution of the iris bombay. Please remember, this is the difference between doing it in primary situations and doing it in secondary pupillary block. So you, uh, like I said, you have to complete the iridotomy. And subconjunctal, sorry, supracorrectal hemorrhage is something that Prof. Keith Barton has spoken in detail, so I don't think I will go back. So I just want to finish by telling you the key points with respect to TRAB in the first few weeks so that you understand that you may encounter these situations in one in four to five cases, not all of them together, but one 
or the other, wound leak, overfiltration or underfiltration, as well as congestive bleps. Situations that are less commonly encountered post tram is uh, in one in ten is about encap in is encapsulation and rarely encountered but are very serious and site threatening are suprachoroidal hemorrhage and aqueous misdirection. So I will end by summarizing that recognition of the features of filtration in a blood is absolutely essential and post op weeks one to six are the most critical. Multiple maneuvers are available for post-operative management of uh, underfiltration or even the other complications that we talked about, but such maneuvers are time sensitive. So when used appropriately at the correct time, it will ensure blep survival. And it is essential for ostium to be patent. Please remember, many people do many maneuvers without doing a gonioscopy and then later on find that the ostium was not patent and then call the procedure as a failure when such maneuvers are undertaken. And every bleb has to be nursed. And unlike follow-up in cataract surgery, one size does not fit all in trabeculectomy. You have to customize. That is what trabeculectomy is all about. Thank you very much for a very patient listening. Sorry. Yeah. Thank you very much, Dr. Vanita. It, is, it was very elaborate lecture and very informative. And superb. We enjoyed thoroughly and we learned a lot. Uh, so, just for the PGs, you know, the trabeculectomy still is a gold standard, at least in India. You know, in the Western country, probably uh, the other surgeries might be taking over the uh, filtration surgeries like uh, trabeculectomies. But in India, the trabeculectomy is still a gold standard. It, it's widely performed. The first reason is that, that we were taught by our teachers how to perform a trabeculectomy, and we are teaching to our students that how to perform a good trabeculectomy. But still, howsoever could you do the trabeculectomy, it has many problems, and Dr. Vanita has dealt it very nicely, that almost 25% of the patient, what she summarized, that they have problem either over-filtration or under-filtration. And literally, you have to nurture your patient, patients like uh, the parents nurture their baby. Then only your trabeculectomy survive for very long. The trabeculectomy, when you decide to do, then it's always a double-edged sword. On the one side, the patient feels that it's a curative treatment for, your, for his glaucoma. That is not so. And on the other hand, you feel that, okay, you have done the job, but you have to struggle not only in the short duration, that is what Dr. Vanita has told up to six weeks, but even beyond and even 10 years, 15 years, we are struggling our, with our patients who were operated by me about 15, 20 years before, and they are coming to the bad leak, over filtration, and so on and so forth. Uh, so it's, uh, it's a very difficult, but the early post-operative complications were very nicely, comprehensively covered by Dr. Vanita. Thank you very much. And here I would like to invite Dr. Harsh to give his comment. Thank you, Prateep. And I think uh, very rightly said, I think she wonderfully covered everything and very nicely for the postgraduates with such a great elaboration at each point. And uh, like uh, just one or two points, one, uh, some of the points I'll take over. And uh, like she rightly said, and uh, Keith had said that he doesn't believe in massage, but I think in India, we really believe in massage. No, and I said I don't believe. I very much believe in massage. No, I said <laughs> Keith, you didn't listen Keith. to me. Sorry. <laughs> Keith Barton. I, Keith Barton. I said just Keith, so I will say Keith Barton. Okay. And that is why I wanted to reiterate that we believe very much in this massage process. And it works wonders. And one time I actually read up that some people uh, tell that you go on and doing it for life. And I have one patient uh, operated in Punjab. The mother says that I exactly know when the, when the thing is hard and I do the massage and things become okay. So it is, it is a good process. Uh, one trick I want to tell everybody is that uh, take the pressure. Uh, do the massage, see how much it is coming down, make the patient sit down for some time, 
call them in now you teach them the massage and see uh, how he is doing it check the pressure check the bleb again if again make him sit down again so let, let him spend 2 hours over there but once he is going out you have to be sure that who is doing the massage in the way you have taught it and exactly the same way the pressure is lowering then they keep asking you sir kitni bar karna hai so you have to tell them all right so what i do sometimes is i make them sit down ki and the, we keep doing the ncd they say all right after 2 hours the pressure is rising to this extent so you repeat the massage when you are sitting idle after every 2 to 3 hours but obviously always once you wake up in the morning and once at the night it is a must to be done okay that is one part and obviously there are various ways each person adopts to his own like i tell them to do it from the below the lid and uh, sometimes from above like she was teaching so there are different ways in which you can teach the idea is to press the globe and allow the aqueous to leak out of the blood so that is the basic idea and you explain to them exactly what you are trying to do the second thing is that uh, you may be surprised sometimes that the iop may be 3 mm the chamber may be not shallow and yet there will be an over filtration so that is very surprising but i have had it number of times and then obviously you have to do an uh, posterior segment oct you take check the uh, folds in the oct and many a times you can keep waiting for some time uh, by all the means that she had taught you and uh, see whether the things are improving and that you can actually see an oct macular folds and if, if you have just by yourself only by dilatation you can see whether the folds are improved if the folds are not improving uh, they might stick together form an erm and then you may have to go in and once you go in i think you uh, because i think uh, she did give give you an option of just doing an air injection and a lot of people just at many at though she uh, she very rightly underlined all the tricks that are in the trade but i'll like to caution you that just doing an air injection but just putting in visco may not help you have to deal with the cause so you may have to open up see where it is leaking from close that either by a simple suture or sometimes you may actually have to use a scleral flap to do that and that then will be okay again there's another situation where there can be a normal kind of an ac but very low iop and the bleb is flat and that foxes us many times so that sometimes could be a formation of a small cyclodialysis cleft or something like that which you can check by gonioscopy and ubm or many a times there could be a ciliary body shut down and if you give steroids then sometimes it uh, kicks in again and i would uh, like her to also comment uh, one thing is on the size of the bcl and uh, uh, how of how long should one bcl be kept because at least i checked with some cornea fellow and he said ki sir normally you should remove after 3 to 4 weeks and change the bcl or maybe restabilize or something like that maybe she'll comment on that and the size of bcl also so over to you uh, vanita please yeah when bcl is concerned i usually go for uh, the, the 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 really large ones in millimeter yeah 15.5 so i use 15 mm and yes i use up to 3 weeks um and i use it with antibiotic prophylaxis i don't withdraw antibiotics at all so bcl is a uh, risk factor for infection definitely and one should be careful about it and so that, uh, one 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 small thing uh, do you ever you have you ever used anti vegf uh, for reducing the vascularization of the bleb no but i have heard people remarking anecdotally that it does not Okay. that it does not work so anti vegfs don't come cheap uh, i i thought of doing it a, a, a while when you know at the end of the retina or if anything is left yeah uh, yeah sometimes yeah. actually tell them to leave something for us <laughs> it's yeah i i i have uh, i had rather do uh, five a few uh, actually sometimes i also inject a little bit of dexamethasone with it but i don't want to um, you know confuse students because if they talk too much about steroids you know at exams they will be penalized so they have to be 
careful. So there are a few questions. Uh, I'll try and answer them uh, very briefly. How many days of doxycycline for wound leak management? Uh, I normally give 100 milligrams twice daily, minimum for two weeks uh, with bandage contact lens in trabeculectomy. Uh, in two weeks, you can remove the contact lens. Keep those, it those, uh, those 100 milligrams twice a day. Milligrams so. twice daily. Uh, for how many? For two weeks? 15 days. Yeah. Two weeks. Two weeks. Minimum two weeks. And, uh, but I showed you a case where I kept him on two and a half months. He was happy with me because he didn't need to go back to the OR. <laughs> uh, and he, he didn't mind taking the medication. Yeah, the 100 milligram probably per day for yeah. longer duration is also okay. Yes, it's okay. And, and mm -hmm. along with that, Vanita, probably amino glycoside drops can be given. No, because they are also... You know, I have tried that in the past, but, you know, I have not had much success. I have had more success with doxycycline. This much I can say. So, that is why... Because I the NSAIDs are recommended. And both, of you, both of you, do you have any comment? Because I think Professor Ramanjit normally gives uh, mitomycin drops and mitomycin, she can put a, a swab sometimes, she put on the top of the plate for some time. Any idea about that? For? Uh, for this failing bleb. Failing bleb. <laughs> Mitomycin, I think we should, we, you know, uh, uh, keep out of the discussion right now because of it. Uh, but mitomycin, I, I do, when I do needling, I will repeat mitomycin. I will not give patient mitomycin uh, unless there is a gap of at least four to six weeks. So, Original trap surgery, mitomycin, if I'm doing a needling, it has to be six weeks later, not, not before. I don't want to repeat mitomycin C so and many. How much exact mitomycin will you inject while you are doing the needling? 20 micrograms. So right. I have calculated that if I uh, dilute it to 0.4 milligram per mil, which everyone does mostly, then I take 0 0.05 mil of this, I actually dilute it in lignocaine 2%. So it becomes, the dilution becomes 0.2%. So when I'm injecting, the uh, dilution is less, but the dose remains the same, which is 20 micrograms. So that is, that is what I do um, for uh, traps. And I may increase it a little bit for needling because at the end of the day, needling is a failed trap. So it, it is a special situation. So giving the subcalentival mitomycin or uh, putting the swab or, uh, or the Johnson bud soaked in the mitomycin over the plate, I think serve the same purpose. Uh, there is not much difference. The only risk with the subcalentival mitomycin C, when Vanita showed that, you know, she presses to diffuse the mitomycin C, there is always a slightest possibility that it might trickle down into the entry chamber. And then it might be a toxic to the endothelium. No, was no. it pre-trap or post -trap? No, pre-trap. This is all pre-procedure. Pre-procedure. And there is ample evidence that says that mitomycin only takes a few seconds to become intravascular. It does not stay uh, in the region. That is why when you open up after injected mitomycin, you don't even need to wash it. That 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 is the uh, that that was the what the paper said. So, do you uh, modify your dose of this injectable, or do you are you putting a standard dose for uh, primary traps? Standard dose. If I'm repeating, if or I'm, if I'm doing needling, then I will increase the dose dosage. I will make it. If it's a secondary trap, then you'll increase the dosage. Or I really do traps in secondary glaucoma. Rarely. That's a useful. You. That's what I'm asking. Are yeah, you, you could. You could increase. Definitely, you could increase. But you, the the chances of complications related to mitomycin C also then increase. So one has to be a little careful. Careful there. But do you do you give wash regularly, or you don't give because it absorb it? No. See also. what I do actually for a trap. Now I wasn't talking about a trap. I was talking post trap. Is I give the mitomycin C in the preoperative area. It, there is generally between the uh, mitomycin C injection and shifting, there is generally 15 to 20 minutes. 
Once patient is in the OR, I have created the flap, trabeculectomy flap. Underneath the flap, I will put a sponge, one minute of 0.4 milligram per mil, and then wash it copiously. But if I don't put the sponge under the flap, I will, I don't wash it. It's not, it's not required. It's intravascular. This, the sponge application requires a wash because it's immediate. Right. Because it's immediate. That's that's my understanding. Okay. Right. Can we take another question? Yeah, you have uh, some more. How do you identify posterior draining bleb clinically? I showed you how you identify it. It should not be anterior. It should not be localized. It should, you know, your um, it should look diffuse and it should look as though it is um, gone back. And how you prepare that is by you know using uh, sponges far in the uh, deep into the pockets or congenital pockets, or you can even do, I, I routinely use injected mitomycin C. So the myblebs are all created by injected mitomycin C. Uh, then uh, can you please repeat LPI difference in normal done and oh, angle push. No, normally you will not do LPI. I said, I will just put the share the screen, share my screen again. Uh, you will do, um, LPI in angle closure only, but what I meant was angle closure versus in secondary pupillary block. So in angle closure, what will you do? You will use the superior V, meaning between maybe 1130 to 1230, or maybe a little bit further, but do not allow that uh, PI to bisect your the lid of the patient. If you do that, then the tear film here gives patients symptoms and they start complaining. So you're giving them symptoms when they had none in, uh, in, in previously. Or you can do it completely nasally or completely temporarily, but do not do it where it is bisecting so at 10 and 2 o'clock is something you need to avoid, which is something I see most people doing, actually, and possibly because they are not using the lens. You should be using an iridectomy lens. And where okay. secondary pupillary block is concerned, what is known as iris bombay, where you get pupillary uh, blockage due to uh, posterior synechy, then you target the hump, the largest hump. So here you are allowed to do it mid peripheral. You can see I'm nowhere near where I suggested it should be. It is mid peripheral where the, where the hump was, where the largest um, collection of aqueous was. And that is what leads to um, resolution of the iris Bombay. So uh, Manika, uh, uh, you rightly pointed out that avoid those areas which are covering the lid. Yeah. But besides that, and leaving secondary glaucomas for primary angle closure glaucomas, uh, the PI currently the thinking is that you can do the PI at any point where the angle is deep enough, and you find a crypt. So uh, the, uh, the the uh, the sighting, except for the two, uh, very rightly you pointed out and showed exactly, you should avoid there and you basically can wherever the limbus bisects the uh, yeah. lid. So that is very of the limbus you should avoid. Yeah. It is the ear film meniscus basically it causes a dysphotopsia. Right. So yeah. You should avoid that area. Yeah. yeah. Any so, any but, role but of for, steroids in post trap choroids, Vanita? Huh? Sorry? Any role any of role oral of steroids in post trabeculate me? Yes, yes. Uh, definitely if the if you have deemed that there is inflammation and the inflammation is causing uh, your choroidals or choroidal exudation, then definitely you can increase your topical steroids and you can even consider oral steroids. But quite often, the choroidals are due to hypotony and increased transmural pressure causes this uh, collection within that virtual space, which is the suprachoroidal space. So actually, if you're giving steroids in those situations where the eye is quiet, it's, it's not doing much. Basically, your hypotony is being caused. Uh, your hypotony is causing the choroidals. You need to make efforts to get the hypotony to resolve for whatever reason it has happened. Um, mm. 
for wound leak, how long should conservative management be tried before suturing? Well, if you use a bandage contact lens and if you use doxycycline, I would say bandage contact lens tamponades the wound and leads to um, uh, resolution. I, I can't remember the last time I took a patient to the OR to do resuturing since I have been doing doing this so um, you know it avoids taking the patient back to her the moment you say tell the patient we need to go back they know there and then they start melting so uh, it's always better to be able to manage conservatively and to learn how to be able to manage uh, conservatively okay ma'am kindly explain bleb massage again okay basically bleb massage i explain to the patient to go from the side because if you go from bottom, I find that they are pressing on the bone and top, of course, does not help. So I ask them to go from the side. I ask them to count one, two, three, and at four, leave your pressure. Take it off. Why? Because you don't want constant pressure on the eye. That is bad for the eye. That is bad for the optic nerve. You can actually occlude your nerve if they are pressing really hard. Uh, not optic nerve, sorry. Op <laughs> I'm hungry now. <laughs> is <laughs> the, um, the um, central artery. So you should not be, uh, so that is why I say count one, two, three, four, leave at four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Quite often I put my finger underneath and see how much pressure they're putting and keep, keep counting. So, and as uh, Dr. Harsh pointed out, I do the same. I, I make them wait. I make them do the massage. I check the pressure again. So it is hard work for looking after a trap. And you need to do that for the patient to understand that this is not a magic surgery, that things can go pear-shaped and that they have to take equal responsibility for it to work, for it to succeed. Uh, then the next question is wound leak, how to identify its conjunctival or scleral flap leak clinically? Okay, well, if it is conjunctival in the early postoperative period, obviously it's coming from under the sclera only. So don't worry about it. What you want is the inner uh, wound to be open. You're working against nature to keep it open. Otherwise, your filtration is going to fail. On the other hand, you want the conjunctiva to heal well. For the conjunctiva to heal well, you have to stop that aqueous pouring out of it. If aqueous pours out of it, the mouth will remain open. It will never close. And that is why it's conjunctival leak initially. When you're talking late leakage and you have a scleral fistula, which has formed for whatever reason, whether you use mitomycin C or you know, uh, your uh, flap has melted or whatever, then that's a different matter. That's a different condition altogether. Initially, it is the conjunctival leak that you need to um, manage. Uh, is there a place for gentamicin? I just uh, answered that. Dr. Pratip uh, uh, favors it. I, I don't use it anymore. Uh, and I think that's about it, really, unless anyone else has a comment. Thank and you very much, Vanita. And Pratip. Wonderful. <laughs> yeah, it was a wonderful lecture. You know, there are so many tips and tricks for the trabeculectomy and obviously you cannot cover uh, in one talk, but uh, it was beautifully done. Thank you very much. And uh, looking forward to the next talk uh, on Friday. I know. Yeah. Thank okay, you. Bye. Good night. So you are hungry, so have your dinner <laughs> fast. <laughs> okay.